I don't think I can finish in 15 minutes than now because some anyway I am I think there is some problem I can't see my slide uh, I have sent my slide do, do you want us to uh, yeah. present your cases here uh, one second Oh we can see your yes. screen now Yeah. Now can you see? Can you see? No, we can't see your presentation yet. We can see your screen. We can see your folder. No, but now I can see the whole uh, presentation is there on the screen. Uh, no, we we can't see your presentation as of yet. Stop sharing the screen and then share again, ma'am, please. Now, now we can yeah. see your presentation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to have this molecular tumor board, and uh, I've been asked to present some uh, compound and rare mutations in. Uh, you know, uh, oncogene-driven uh, lung cancer, and uh, I would, uh, you know, achieve this by presenting certain cases. And I'd like to call upon my panelists. Uh, is Dr. Bharat Jasani there? Uh, Monica from yes, Germany. Mm -hmm. Then uh, Dr. Trupti Pai, pathologist yeah. from Mumbai. Then Dr. Vikas Talreja, medical oncologist uh, from Kanpur. Dr. Hollis Tissouza, medical oncologist from Mumbai. Uh, Dr. Akhil Kapoor, uh, medical oncologist from Varanasi. Uh, Dr. Anuradha Chaugule, uh, molecular pathologist from TMH. Uh, Dr. Pratik Chandrani, molecular pathologist. And Dr. Amit Tath, you've just heard, so doesn't need more introduction. So, uh, you know, the rapid advances in tissue and blood-based uh, 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 genotyping has led to an explosion of knowledge about the molecular biology of lung cancer and has dissected it into various, uh, uh, you know, subgroups which are very easily targetable. Now, the clinicians know that the more you ask, the more answers may confuse you. And we have really shifted from the lonely driver to an orchestra of mutations. So let's see this orchestra of mutations. Um, uh, so if you see the ch changing landscape, uh, I'm going to cover it by the rare mutations, the compound mutation, and the uncommon EGFR mutations with illustrative cases. Uh, or is Dr. Vanita Narona there? Because she was also supposed to join in. Is she there? Okay, so let's come to the first case. Now, this is a 60 year, 8 year old male patient who presented with a submental swelling in uh, since three months. Hypertensive uh, smoker, but stopped uh, 20 years back. Clinically submental, no 2 into 2 centimeters. The histopathology was adenocarcinoma. Uh, with CK7, CK20, focal TTF1 positive, consistent with primary lung. The PET scan showed a level 1B node and a cavitating lesion in the left upper lobe, subpleural nodules uh, in various parts of the say, in ipsilateral and opposite lung with mediastinal nodes. And uh, the molecular uh, reports showed that the EGFR ALK ROS1, BRAP were negative. The PDL, the TPS score was 15%, and the patient was uh, started on pembrolizumab and car carboplatin, awaiting subsequent NGS report. Now, I'd like to uh, ask uh, our uh, uh, first the molecular pathologist, and I'd like to start with Dr. Bharat Jasani, uh, that uh, how has the scenario changed after you've gone from you know, like uh, uh, individual and sequential testing to the NGS uh, platform, 
and uh, um, you know identifying so many more mutations. So, what has been your experience in this? So, so I, I have to excuse myself. I've done that in the past panel. I'm very much a listener here. Okay. So, okay. you may pass the question to. Okay. I'm sorry, you know, you were listed as one of the panelists. Uh, Dr. Anuradha Chaugule there? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm there. So, looking at uh, EGFR R cross, all this negative and PDL1 just with 15% positive, I think. Uh, we uh, don't know, on the NGS report we will get some driver actionable mutations or not, but uh, I think chemotherapy will be the best option over here. Yeah, so now in the TMH experience, uh, once you have gone from, you know, the older methods like Sanger sequen uh, sequencing and sequential, uh, you know, uh, detection of these mutations to the NGS platform, uh, what is your experience with uh, detecting compound and rare mutations? Dr. Chaugule? Uh, hello? Yeah, yeah. Tripti wants to answer that, yeah. Yeah, yeah Dr. Tripti? Hi, so like uh, before 2019, so initially we used to do just this single gene based testing and then there is no question of this compound mutations and all. But now, if, but I would like to make a point that even with today financial and time constraints, sometimes it is still a, a sequential or reflex testing and then like this scenario when initially all tests are negative then later we go for NGS and with NGS definitely we have this uh, uh, more occurrence of uh, concurrent mutations or compound mutations. Yes. So, so this is a perfect scenario where you go initially with EGFR ALK and later ask for NGS. Okay. Now uh, coming to our medical oncologist. Uh, considering this report, what treatment would you select for this patient? Would you select chemotherapy with pembrolizumab, carboplatin or a CTIO combination or an IOIO combination? Uh, can I ask Dr. Vikas Taldeja? Is he there? Dr. Vikas Taldeja? Uh, Sam Hollis, yeah. Uh, Dr. Hollis, yeah. Can you answer that? Yeah, it's a limited, uh, it's a lim low burden disease, so I will be comfortable with the uh, permutation carboplatin, but if the patient is affordable, definitely permit, uh, Pembro, Pemcarbo. I will okay. not go for Nevo AP uh, upfront in this patient. Uh, what about Dr. Akhil Kapoor? Yeah, ma'am, I agree. Uh, Pembro plus chemo will be a preferred option if uh, f affordable. Okay. Is Dr. Vanita Narona there? Okay, so I'd just like to ask you that you have sent out an NGS report. Now, uh, are you going to uh, start the patient on IO before you get the NGS report or uh, uh, you will, uh, you know, wait till that report comes before using the IO? Uh, so, yes. EGFR would have been an issue. I would have waited for uh, the NGS report, but if EGFR is negative, I might not wait for... Uh, the permit for the NGS report, I'll start off with uh, Pembro, Pemcarbo. Yes, I uh, know, I mean, uh, chemotherapy is okay. I'm talking about the immune checkpoint inhibitor. The TPS score is 15%. We'll wait for the NGS report. We'll yeah. The NGS report. yeah, and what is the reason for that? It's very important. Uh, uh, what is the reason that you would not add an IO right now when you are waiting for the NGS report? Uh, Dr. Spruti, but uh, since the PDL one is just showing 15% on IHC, I don't think we are going to expect any uh, IO check inhibitors in the NGS report. No, uh, what I'm saying, oh no, uh, there is another clinical reason why we don't add an IO to the chemotherapy okay. before receiving the NGS report. So, Dr. Hollis, this is a, you'd like to say something? Uh, yeah, ma'am, if there are any crypt, uh, in, uh, new mutations that, uh, that are detected on NGS, if there is an EGFR mutation that is picked up on NGS that is not picked up on PCR, uh, IO might not be the, my best uh, option for this patient. So, definitely for this scenario, I will wait till I start, um, I'll wait till I get the NGS report. Yeah, so it's very important because, uh, you know, IO doesn't work well when there is a driver mutation and if there is a driver mutation, uh, you know, the toxicity that is involved as far as the lung is concerned sometimes, then you put the IO on uh, after uh, 
uh, or if you put the uh, targeted agent on after IO, then the lung toxicity also has to be considered. So that is why if you have sent out the NGS, uh, you should wait for that report before uh, adding on the immune checkpoint inhibitor, very important point. Uh, so this is the report. Now, uh, doc, any of the molecular pathologists would like to comment on this report? Dr. Pratik Chandrani or... Uh, uh, since yeah. this report is showing the canonical fusion and it has been uh, highlighted as a pathogenic in tier 1, I think definitely we can go for the TKI therapy for this. Yeah. So, uh, now what is the importance of this variant? You know, the K, uh, KIF5B17... Uh, can you tell me what's the importance of this? Uh, anybody like Dr. Trupti Pai or uh, Dr. Prasit Chandani or anybody? So you mean about the specific fusion partner with yes. red? Yes. So this KIF5B is the most common fusion partner which is described in NSSLC as compared to that of th thyroid, medullary or papillary carcinoma. Yes. This is the commonest fusion partner for lung, non-small cell carcinoma. And uh, that's it. I think the rest, it is important yes. to identify this fusion because they have specific RET inhibitors, targeted yes. treatment yes. with a good response. Yeah. So Dr. Hollis, this was up. I'd just like to ask you, that uh, uh, you know you will uh, try to consider treatments uh, which uh, you know uh, actually target the red uh, fusion that you are seeing in this report so this variant uh, does it have any implication as far as the treatment is concerned uh, now ma'am looking at the real world scenario if i started a patient on chemotherapy and i get this uh, mutation definitely sulfurcatalyst is available i am going to go with sulfurcatalyst which is not the scenario now. Maybe in the next one year or so, sulfurcatalyst is available, I'll go ahead with this. Now with a TPS of 15, if I have started a patient on Tembro, if it would have been EGFR, I'll, I might not have continued with Tembro. But with RET, there are definitely case reports that Tembro does work even in RET mutated. Now, sulfurcatalyst has come from, a, it's not come from a phase 3 data, it's come from a phase 1B2 data. So I might not be very comfortable using this uh, TKI upfront in this patient. Yeah, so... Uh, what about Dr. Akhil Kapoor? Uh, Ma'am, uh, if uh, available easily, for example, presently sulfurcatinib is now available on compassionate access. Initially, pralcetinib was available, now sulfurcatinib is available on compassionate access. Uh, if it can be procured fast enough, we can uh, uh, start with sulfurcatinib as well. We, uh, I believe that there is now sufficient data to use red inhibitors up front uh, with us now. Yes, because in both the places, uh, uh, it has been shown that uh, although uh, the results are as good in first line uh, as in second line, but as of now, they are approved for second line Not after atinum-based chemotherapy. Uh, so, may I add here? May I add something here? Yes. Now, when we are procuring this drug on a compassionate basis, hmm. uh, I have applied for very few uh, drugs like this. But in your experience, do you feel that uh, they get rejected because of concomitant mutations? Yeah, like they could, but I'll come to that regarding this okay. patient. Now, uh, you know why the KIF5B is important? Because that is the one which is actually sensitive to these new TKI inhibitors, which are specific for red. So, uh, as you know, that uh, you also have cabozantinib available, lenvatinib available. Then why, why do you hesitate to use those uh, drugs here? Since uh, you know you will have problems in procuring. Now, uh, wh why would you hesitate to use those drugs? What are your concerns? Um, Ma'am, we are not organ specific for lungs. That, was, that is the only concern with yeah. red and blue indications. Yeah, they are multi-kinase inhibitors. So they are not specific for red. And uh, whatever results have been shown, uh, they are much inferior to what we have got with pralcetinib and circle uh, tactinib. So that is why it is important. But these two drugs act only if this partner mutation uh, partner is there in the variant. So um, uh, that is why this variant is important. And now this patient had a partial response to chemotherapy, uh, four cycles, pembrolizumab and carboplatin, but progressed on maintenance PEM in September 2021. And we were able to get 
uh, pralcetinib, in fact, he is the last patient enrolled on the compassionate uh, basis program and he has been commenced on pralcetinib and uh, we'll uh, see how he responds, you know, he's not responded to the chemo. So let's see his response to pralcetinib. So now uh, this is the arrow trial and as you can see, as opposed to cabozantinib and lenvatinib where the response rates are like 27% and the duration of response may be just 4 to 5 months, uh, you know, pralcetinib has got 65% response rate and the duration of response is not reached and so similarly with sulcarptinib. So naturally these two are the preferred treatments today for this type of mutation in non-small cell lung cancer. Now this is the second case, uh, again a 58 year old female metastatic adenocarcinoma, EGFR and ALK negative, uh, received PEMRO and CARBO6 with PEM maintenance 9 cycles, discontinued due to some renal dysfunction. She again was lost to follow up and came in 2017. Uh, a radiotherapy was given to the femur and tibia. Uh, Packley card was stopped due to peripheral neuropathy. Again, progression, she only agreed to gem. And then again, uh, since the renal function had improved PEM carbo. And in uh, 2020, when NGS uh, became available, missense mutation of the BRAF gene was uh, seen. So, what other details would you want? Dr. Anuradha Chauvale, is it enough to just say uh, missense mutation BRAF gene or what other details would you give to the clinician? Uh -huh. Dr. If, uh, Dr. Yeah. Uh, if this BRAF, BRAF mutation is a targeted one, then definitely I think only... Uh, the, at present, we don't have other than BRAF on the NGS report. I think they can go for the TKI therapy if this is BRAF no, uh, canonical mutation like V600E. Or, but mm -hmm. here it has not been mentioned which mutation no, it is. So that's what I wanted to know from you. Yeah. That what other uh, uh, things you would include in the report? Yeah, I would include, uh, since it is a, a somatic mutation, I would uh, mention which type of mutation it is, which is, whether it is a V600E or the other mutation, and uh, uh, the overall coverage, the depth, and the vari uh, VAF, that is the varietal frequency of it, I would like to have in the report. So, uh, Dr. Hollis D'Souza, uh, what are you looking at in the report uh, for to take treatment decisions? Uh, Ma'am, yes, I am looking whether it is a V600A mutation present in BRAF. Because Pabratanib, yes. Pramatanib are specific for that mutation. Yes. Uh, what about you, Dr. Akhil Kapoor? Yeah, ma'am. In addition to V600D, the VAF percentage is also important. Uh, so, these two things at least. And definitely, if we have the uh, privilege to get other information like coverage and all, that will be helpful. But principally, as a clinician, these two are very important for us. So, Dr. Kurti uh, Pai, can you yes. tell me that uh, he mentioned the VAP uh, level. So, how is it important for BRAF gene? So, usually it depends on the lab what cutoff of uh, variant allele frequency uh, you take to describe it is in tier 1 or tier 2 or whatever. So, all depends on the tumor percentage and and variant allelic frequency. So here in BRAF, we need to mention which is the exon and whether it is V600E or whether it is non-V600E. And if the tumor percentage is adequate, more than 5% VAF is uh, taken as uh, good for considering it as tier 1. Okay. So this was the, it's a tier 1 pathogenic missense mutation exon 15 BRAF gene. So it is a V600E mutation and uh, uh, it is a pathogenic mutation. So uh, Dr. Hollis D'Souza, you got all the uh, full report now. So uh, what would be your line of treatment in this patient? Ma'am, uh, ideally speaking, I want uh, tabrafenib, pramatinib, dual combination. Hmm. But this patient has been multiply treated for the past five years. So hmm. uh, my experience was with Dual combination, Tabra, Trematinib is not very great, the tolerance is not good, also the real world data is lacking, but the trial data is very promising. So I might start with Tabra alone and then add Trematinib from the second stage. You would, you would start with Debra Fenimib? And add on Trematinib from the second stage, from the second one. Why is that so? 
Ma'am, I'm not uh, have used this in two patients, and both patients have not had good response, uh, good uh, tolerance to both drugs together. Okay. Also, the the what are the toxicities that you have encountered, Doctor Akhil? Yeah, Kapoor would have been uh, yeah. maybe a patient with uh, one to two years of therapy. I would have gone for the drug and the tablet and the doctor. Okay, Doctor Akhil Kapoor. Uh, Ma'am, definitely this depends on the experience and availability of the drugs. Uh, if patient is uh, sufficient uh, up to PS2, I would be happy to start dabrafenib plus trametinib with close monitoring of the toxicities. The dose will be required to be adjusted as per the tolerance of the patient. Um, um, but uh, definitely, um, it depends on the performance status and tolerability of the patient. But uh, going by the standard uh, approach, I would be tempted to use dabrafenib plus tramet combination. Okay. So uh, the patient was commenced on this, but stopped due to gastritis. Uh, and as you can see, you know she has not been a very cooperative patient all along. She is in partial remission three months, and she has received some chemotherapy. So this is the uh, data of uh, dabrafenib and trametinib. And as you can see, uh, uh, in first line or oh, and second line, there isn't much difference. So you can use these drugs in first line or second line. Uh, you can see that the median PFS and the median overall survival are almost similar in both these. And as uh, mentioned before, that this is useful in only the BRAF V600E. So the non V600E uh, is still an unmet need there, and uh, you know we have to find ways of uh, targeting that. Uh, so now this is the third case. Uh, uh, can I interrupt here? Yeah. Uh, if yeah. the previous case had some non V six hundred E mutation with yes. a good VAF, what would have been the approach from uh, the clinic? Uh, uh, yeah, Doctor Hollis, would you like to take that or shall I answer, Doctor Hollis? Well, uh, you know, I, yeah. Yeah, ma'am. Akhil here. Yeah. So definitely, ma'am. We don't have good data for non V six hundred D. I would be happy to use uh, if immunotherapy is feasible, uh, immunotherapy uh, or chemotherapy. Uh, definitely not Dabra plus trametinib in such yes, patients. Because uh, it has shown no benefit at all in uh, non V six hundred D BRAF mutation. So there, you would have to depend on other uh, systemic therapies like chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Now this is a third case. Uh, Ma'am, uh, sorry to interrupt. Can you please uh, conclude in next couple of minutes considering yes, these uh, last case? This is a year old oh. patient. No comorbidities, non-smoker, presence with cough, uh, salient investigations, uh, right lower lobe ma mass, uh, mediastinal nodes, uh, and then of course bilateral pulmonary nodules and uh, the histopathology again adenocarcinoma commenced on. Pembrolizumab and Carbo awaiting NGS results, and you can see here that uh, the uh, fish was negative. RT-PCR shows an exon 20 insertion. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, now, uh, Doctor uh, Trupti Pai, um, uh, what would you say about these exon 20 insertions? Are they homogeneous or they are heterogeneous? No, exon 20 insertions is a very heterogeneous and we can have more than 100 variants for this. And yes. definitely on real-time PCR, you cannot identify which is the typical insertion, I mean, which is the sequence. So, NGS is the answer for it to identify the exact insertion type. As now we have uh, many targeted treatments specifically and we know that uh, amino acid sequence 763 to 764 uh, typically involving those areas are more sensitive to certain kind of drugs as compared to other duplications. Yeah. So, Dr. Hollis, this, uh, <clears throat> what treatment would you offer this patient? Uh, Ma'am, uh, maybe a partner in the front line, the patient is affording uh, osimertinib. I might not go with semitation carboplatin upfront for this patient. No, uh, this is an exon 20 insertion. Yes, Ma'am. Yes. Uh, we so have a Phase 2 data for osimertinib, high dose 160 mg for uh, in, presented in ASCO this year. So, apart from the front line, uh, osimertinib 160 mg, if uh, an on progression, maybe an uh, permutation again. Uh, Amivantana, posiotinib, I am not very sure. Mm. Uh, Dr. Akhil Kapoor? Uh, Ma'am, first of all, as uh, highlighted by Trupti Ma'am also, I would like to know the uh, exact mutation if because it is an NGS has already been done. So mm -hmm. whether it is YWA mutation, 763, 764 exons are involved or not, mm -hmm. that will decide whether I am going to use TKI or not. 
if if these uh, the mutations are not classical of these two uh, if uh, trial for amivantanib like it is available at tmh mumbai presently i would like to enroll the patient in amivantanib trial if nothing of these is feasible i would be more than happy to use chemotherapy but not tki yes. if yes. we i don't have sufficient information and reserve tki is like afatinib in the second yes. see uh, afatinib has been used in uncommon mutations but in uh, exon 20 the response rate has been a mere 8% uh, percent or so and yes. similarly even with high dose osimertinib the response rates are um, uh, not very gratifying and uh, uh, so that is why um, as i said um, uh, these are all the real world data where chemotherapy has been used and you can see that uh, not very gratifying results uh, you have a median pfs of about uh, you know 6 to 7 months and uh, even the overall survival is poor and uh, I, as i said even see i dose osimertinib uh, that is the position study the response rate is just 27% uh, so these are the new therapies and uh, as i know that uh, amivantama uh, may be available on a compassionate basis from the company very shortly so this uh, patient could avail of that Uh, the others are not available so then if uh, nothing is available it would be chemotherapy but as uh, rightly dr akhil kapoor said and uh, uh, this is important so if you look at this sensitizing mutations and you look at the a763 v764 uh, fqeea uh, if you have this uh, mutation then you can use the egfr tk as especially afatinib or even osimertinib because this is the only um, exon 20 insertion uh, which is sensitive to uh, uh, the uh, tki so that is the importance of this now this is the last case i am going to because of shortage of time actually there is one more case this patient hypertensive presenting with paraparesis underwent laminectomy adenocarcinoma lower lung lesion brain mets mediastinal nodes liver and bone mets mri brain showed small asymptomatic brain mets and this is the um, uh, actual report that he is alk uh, fusion positive so uh, now uh, i would uh, like to ask uh, dr hollis this was uh, what would you uh, offer this patient dr hollis okay. yeah alk positive with brain mets huh? yes uh i'm a supporting it मेंुटेशन so i would like uh, dr uh, trupti and dr anuradha chaugle and dr pratik chandrani are there to comment on this report uh, so here uh, uh, alk fusion is very well detected with uh, a very high fusion rate count so uh, that is uh, uh, definitely helpful and uh, apart from that met exon 14 skipping has also been detected with sufficient read count uh, so combined together uh, here alk is a better targetable uh, option and uh, more actionable in my opinion okay. uh, uh, why is a uh, exon for skip mutation tier 2 here i think yeah. it should be tier 1 yeah it should be tier 1 um, maybe you know uh, they have just mentioned that uh, uh, in fact even i asked them that actually it's a uh, uh, you know it's a targetable mutation and it is pathogenic yeah. so it should be tier 1 uh, only thing is now i want to know from the molecular pathologist that you know clinicians are now faced with this compound mutation uh, how do you really decide on which is the main driver can you just uh, tell us about that doctor uh, trupti uh, 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 as uh, pratik rightly pointed out since the fusion rates are very high with the alk uh, i think we should go ahead first with the alk and then if the patient shows resistance i think we can next think of the um, uh, med uh, resist uh, tki therapy is there any other you know techniques used to know 
which is the driver mutation or which is the more significant mutation apart from this? Uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Amit, can you uh, answer this question? Hello? Uh, uh, right. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, as what you are already kind of alluding to, uh, Pratik has already emphasized upon the facts as the number of reads. Uh, if there is uh, what 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 need to kind of like uh, appreciate over the fact over here that if it is a driver alteration, then a driver alteration would uh, would sweep uh, uh, the the tumor repre the representation in the tumor, and the allele fraction in such a case would be much higher. So uh, taking that logic uh, here, given that the alk fusion reads is significantly high, that is definitely the driver alteration over here which is driving. But given the fact that the MEC exon forty is a known driver alteration and that also co-occurs i would say that both of these alterations are known driver alterations however if you have to like target then then based on the clinical decision that you might kind of like take you might go for an alk inhibitor and uh, that could be one of the first line that you can kind of like go ahead with because usually you get to see that whenever these fusion event happens they tend to make uh, the tumors more homogeneous because they are very strongly activating yeah so dr Wallace. And Dr. Akil, I would like to know, now would you change your ALK inhibitor? No, no ma'am, I, I would be able to continue with electrolytic. The reason I am asking, you know, that Crizotinib is also active for a MET uh, exon 14 skipping mutation and of course it's an ALK inhibitor as well. Uh, so, uh, would you ever consider changing to that? Of course, there is no data that tells us. Uh, when the uh, brain metastasis are there in this patient, I might not consider for Grisotinib. Mm -hmm. uh, only on progression, if I uh, run the NGS and there is a specific mutation which is sensitive to Grisotinib, then I might consider Grisotinib in the second leg. Okay, okay. So, you know, and uh, there is no data to help us that whether we could combine two TKIs and what would be the interaction and what is going to be the toxicity. So, I think we just have to play it by the ear and, you know, use the ALK inhibitor, see how the patient uh, and the patient is being continued on electinib and uh, we'll see whether uh, he gets a required response because he's just been two months on electinib. So, um, uh, how will, uh, okay, so we have finished with this, we've already mentioned this and this is the last case where, uh, you know, patient had again a, a metastatic disease and adenocarcinoma and the patient has an EGFR uh, as well as an ALK mutation. So, just uh, I want to go to again uh, Dr. Wallace uh, D'Souza, uh, what would you do here? I have no correct answer but I have used combination of Crizo and Cefetinib in uh, patients. I have, I have tried Crizo and Osibatinib not work, Crizo and Erlotinib also not work. So I feel that dual therapy will be needed. We don't have a correct answer to this. And if the patient is not tolerating them both, then I might go with ALK inhibitor only. Yeah. Dr. Akhil? Yeah, ma'am. As uh, pointed by, by Hollis, uh, we have now experience of around 20 to 24 patients uh, with this combination. Uh, if patient is fit enough, uh, we would be more uh, happy to use combination if feasible. But if I have to choose only one, it would be ALK. This is our experience that EGFR alone does not work in these patients. This is what our experience suggests. Uh, but definitely using a doublet will be the best, but uh, that, that will have some added toxicities. So that will depend on the performance status of the patient. Okay. So, you know, uh, Jeffitinib was started, but uh, then uh, the patient then came with the ALK report uh, and you can see 15% cells positive started on Crizotinib and uh, last one and a half years patient is being continued on Crizotinib. In fact, this is Dr. Vanita Naruna's uh, case and uh, uh, you know, this is the uh, qualitative synthesis of reported best responses, 100 cases, uh, you know, they collected from the literature and published. And as you can see that if you use an EGFR TKI, the disease control rate is 69% and with ALK TKIs it's 79.5% uh, with the combination uh, but most likely used sequentially it is uh, much higher. So as uh, Dr. Akhil and Dr. Hollis uh, rightly mentioned uh, if they could they would combine but otherwise they would go with the ALK inhibitor rather than the EGFR TKI. So I think this is an important thing because we have come across such cases 
where there is a poor alteration in these patients. And this is a, I, I would also like to thank Dr. Aparna that she has also contributed this case. And again, the same that an ALK and exon 19 deletion coexisting. And uh, you've already mentioned how this should be treated. So you can see, you know, that uh, with this delving more into the molecular biology of uh, tumors, especially uh, non-small cell lung cancer being the prototype, uh, the mutational landscape today to the clinician looks like this Tokyo uh, metro uh, map, uh, you know, so many lines running across and crisscrossing and, you know, having impact on um, uh, the outcome of when you just uh, uh, actually target one of the mutations and leave the other one alone. So I would, with this, I would like to conclude and thank the panelists. I would also like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, ma'am, for uh, a very nice molecular tumor board discussion. Uh, uh,